In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Now, today's Chaplain's Report, like I said the other day, we've been sort of going through the book of Samuel. And that's not because I plan to do all my Chaplain's Reports on the book of Samuel. It just happened to be what I was reading the other day. It's nothing more complicated than that. So you do have to know a little bit of backstory to understand what's going on in this passage of Scripture. So what happens is the priest Eli that we were talking about the other day there are people around Shiloh, there is a, a battle that is going on not really far from him, and it's a battle between the Israelites and their old rivals, the Philistines, and the Philistines wind up taking not only control of that area and not only beating Israel, but they wind up also seizing the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which is the, basically it is God's presence, that's how the Israelites saw it. That's kind of the implication that is given from the law of Moses. You see this all the time in Hebrew poetry. The God that sits between the cherubs or on the mercy seat. That's a reference directly to the Ark of the Covenant. Now, God makes very clear in the law of Moses as well that he cannot actually be held, because he is the God of the universe, of course, uh, he cannot be held by a structure that is created with human hands. And so it's a little more complicated and nuanced than that, but suffice it to say to the players that are involved in this, that's how they see it. And the other little bit of information that you need to know is that Dagon is the main Philistine god. So he's not the only Philistine god, but if the, the, the Philistines were the Greeks, Dagon would be Zeus. If the Philistines were... The, the people who subscribe to Norse mythology, he would be Odin. So, like, Dagon's their really big god that sort of is all-encompassing. Uh, he's not a universal god. He's not an exclusive god. They're not monotheists. They're, they definitely believe in multiple gods. But Dagon's the, the big daddy of them all, if you were to put it into human terms. And so what they do here in this particular passage that we're going to look at describes what happens when they bring Israel's god into the presence of their God, when I use the quotations there, I'm saying because, you know, God's presence is everywhere, so I don't want to uh, state a theological error. I'm just saying this is how they saw it. So let's go ahead and look at this passage after the Philistines have taken the ark into custody after they have won it in a battle. So this is in 1 Samuel 5, 2 through 5, and we'll see here, the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. When the Ab uh, Ashdodites arose early in the, the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him, uh, set him in his place again. But they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off of the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor all who enter Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. So this is a really fascinating piece of scripture, and what's really interesting that you'll notice as a theme as you read through the Old Testament, and, and you have to have some understanding of the historical context to really grasp the gravity of this, is that God is constantly showing pagan societies that come in contact with Israel that know, I am God and your gods are not. Not, I am one God among many, not, I am a God amongst a Parthenon of gods, and some gods have power, and some gods have other power, and I'm the most powerful. That's not the message God sends at all. He is sending the message, I am God, your gods have no power. Your gods are not real. And that's something that is very much on display here. A good example of this historically would be if you were to look, for example, in the book of Exodus. A lot of people really miss this because they don't think about it in paganistic terms. But if you do and you understand the mythology that is going on in the background 
in Egypt, you'll notice that each one of the ten plagues, where God shows his dominance over that physical realm, be it the Nile River, frogs, lice, flies, the death of the cattle, darkness, so on and so forth, what God is doing is he is showing his dominance, not o- only over the physical world, but also a dominance over their God. Each plague actually corresponds to a God in Egypt, a, a God in the Egyptian Parthenon. And God is showing, no, 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 I control this. Your gods do not. Because if they did, they would obviously be able to stop the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they can't because they're just statues. This is what is being shown to the Philistines at this point. Oh, you're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant of God into your temple like a trophy. Yeah, that's not going to work. And in fact, when you do, what you wake up to the next morning is the statue of your God essentially bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because keep in mind, they were pagans and they felt like pagans. So they would have been very astounded when they saw that, but in their mind, the God of Israel is just another God who exists alongside Dagon and alongside other gods. And in fact, you see just a few verses before this, before the battle starts, they were terrified of Israel's God. In fact, they say amongst themselves, wait a second, the Ark of the Covenant is in their camp? Isn't that the God that brought them out of Egypt and all that is like, I don't know that we can fight that. So it's funny, it was almost like the Philistines had more faith in God than the children of Israel did. But anyway, uh, that takes place. And because they were pagans and they think that this is just another God, they bring this God with them like a trophy. Because you have to understand, in their mind, God isn't everywhere or omnipotent like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's just a possession that you can take like any other idol. This is actually illustrated earlier in the book of Genesis, where Laban is very upset with Jacob, even though he doesn't realize that it wasn't Jacob, it was Rachel that did this. Uh, But he's very upset that, and this is the way he phrases it, he's like, you have stolen my gods. And to somebody who thinks like a monotheist and a universal God that is ever present, that sounds dumb. But in Laban's mind, by stealing the little the trinkets and the idols and the little statues, they literally stole his God away from him. And this is exactly what's happening here. They think that they now possess Israel's God. They think that they now control Israel's God, and now that they've won him in a battle, just like they would win, I don't know, a a piece of land or something, that they now control Israel's God, and, and their God is now on their side. And God makes sure, that's why they put him in the temple, and God makes sure to help them understand, no, no, you don't own me, I own you. And in fact, your God, your pagan God, whom you think is just one other God among many, I'm going to have you wake up the next morning and he's bowing down to me. They're like, oh, I guess the wind blew a certain way and knocked this gigantic, you know, stone or wood or whatever, whatever it was, statue down on its face. Let's just sit him back up in the proper place. And then they do in the next morning, just so God made sure that there was no confusion on their part. Not only is their God fallen down again, but he has his palms and his head cut off. And by the way that it says cut off, it somewhat insinuates, and and I can't say this for sure, but it insinuates that it wasn't just like it, it cracked as a result of the fall. It's more like a clean cut. In other words, there's no way that this happened accidentally. There's no way that like the wind came through the tunnel Uh, or sorry, through the temple and just knocked it over or something. No, this was intentional. This was God's doing. This was a supernatural event. And the Philistines must have realized this because you read in that verse how they are terrified of this. And to this day, they don't even, you know, at the time of this writing, the Philistines won't even go inside that temple because of how scared they are that the Ark of the Covenant used to be there and that God made this happen at that time. So this is a very, very powerful showing of God to the Philistines. This is who I am. I am the God. And they at least understood. I don't think that they got the entirety of the message, which is clear based on some of their actions later. 
but they definitely understood this was a very powerful God that they did not want to mess with. And we may go over that at a later time. But the thing is, God was teaching them a lesson, and he was also teaching Israel a lesson. For one, he was teaching, I am not a possession to be trotted out. Like, the Philistines having the ark in my camp is not going to aid them like it did the children of Israel when I wanted them to. It also sent a message that just having the ark in your presence isn't enough. I have to be in your presence. I have to be with you. Just having the physical embodiment of that, the symbol of that, that's not enough. I have to be with you. You have to be with me. And that's what God really wanted all the time. Anyway, now how could the Philistines have reacted to this? Because the way that they reacted is basically out of sheer terror. But the way that they could have reacted is to realize, wow, our God can't do anything. Israel's God can do whatever he wants. Maybe our God isn't real. Maybe this giant hunk of stone or wood or gold or whatever it is that we've been worshiping all these years really isn't all that powerful if it can't even stay erect when God's presence is brought into it. Maybe we shouldn't be worshiping that thing anymore. That's not what they did. They just moved the temple somewhere else, continued to worship their God, and, and then sent the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel, which, again, we'll probably go over at a later date. But what's the message to us today? Because we've talked about what the message should have been to the Philistines and should have been to Israel. What does this passage tell us today? I think that what it says loud and clear is that there is no such thing as an idol that can stand in God's presence. When God is somewhere, any idol that has been erected by us falls. It bows down to him. It is destroyed. So my question then becomes, what idol can God break down in your life? What thing have you set up in your temple of worship? What thing do you sit at the altar of and make sacrifices to as your God? Because it can be a number of different things. It can be status, prestige, fame. It can be something a little less existential. It can be possessions. It can be your job. It can be your family. You know, family is not a bad thing, but it doesn't need to be in the place of God. In fact, we just talked yesterday about how Eli put his sons up on a pedestal and worried more about honoring them than honoring God, and that was his fatal mistake. They wound up costing both them and him his own life. Because he honored them before he honored God. Eli did not believe in other gods. He did not worship idols. And yet he had an idol in his life, just like the Philistines did. And the problem came because he put his sons up on an idol, uh, up on a pedestal to be worshipped as an idol in God's place. And we're just as susceptible to that as at any other time. I think a lot of the times we, we pat ourselves on the back, like, well, thank goodness we don't have to worry about idolatry anymore. The idols don't just come in the form of statues. In fact, when we look at this, I think that the message is, if we want to get the idols out of our life, because sometimes we may not even realize that our idol is there. We may not even realize that this thing that we've been worshiping, that we've erected in the temple of our soul, that it's not God, and we don't need to treat it that way. And so the solution to that is to bring the real God in. And in the real God's presence, any idol that we've put up, it's going to come crashing down. Now, it may take two days. It may take a little longer, as the, Philist as the Philistines learned. But ultimately, if God's presence is within us, our idols will go away. And it may even, like the children of Israel, take a little effort on our part where they had to go up and physically tear down the idols. But the point is, if God's presence was in them, the idols were coming down. And that's exactly what God wants from us. 
You see, if that idol is still standing in your life, then there's a good chance that God's presence just isn't in your life as much as it needs to be. If you have an idol and you're having trouble tearing it down, maybe what needs to happen is exactly what happened in the Philistines' temple. That for that idol to come down, God's presence needs to be in your life a little more. Now, maybe that comes in the form of prayer or Bible study or fellowship or a number of different things, probably a combination of all of those, actually. But ultimately, if we want to get the idols out of our life, if we want God to tear them down, we have to make sure His presence is felt in our souls and in our lives. We have to bring God into our temple. And if we do, those idols will come down. You see, our temple is big enough for a lot of idols. The temple of our, our soul, our spirit, it's got room for a lot of idols. There's a lot of things we can worship. Just like pagan temples, there were lots of altars for lots of different gods. But there is no temple that is big enough for an idol when God is in it. Once God is in that temple, the capacity has been reached. That's why he's infinite. That's why he has no beginning and end. That's why his presence cannot be contained in a single temple. Once God's in there, the idols have to come down. That's the way it works. Maybe our temples are big enough for, you know, even dozens of idols. But the second that God steps in, those idols have to be taken down. There is no room for second place in a temple that is occupied by God. Stay the course, friends. My mother always said if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.